on this beautiful Caribbean island, Fidel Castro has led Cuba for over 40 years. A socialist survivor in a capitalist world. For some, he is a demon. For others, a symbol of resistance and social justice. Ese árbol no existía. Vamos por la casa que fue de la abuela. In 1996, at the age of 70, Fidel revisited his childhood home with a longtime friend, the world famous Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez. En la lengua, con la misma lengua que acababa de decir horror y Fidel began life in Biran, a farming area far from Cuba's capital. He was the third oldest of three boys and four girls. Fidel's father, Ángel, who was an immigrant worker from Spain, eventually became a wealthy sugarcane planter. His parents are buried near the family home. It was in this public school that Fidel first studied as a child. From this simple school, Fidel's family sent him to a Catholic boarding school in Cuba's second largest city, Santiago de Cuba and then to the Jesuit-run Belen High School in Havana. Él puede hacer alarde de ser el hombre que más memoria tiene que yo conozca. Hay una cosa que hacía él, las asignaturas que no le gustaban, él se las aprendía gráficamente, gráficamente de memoria. De modo que arrancaba las páginas del libro Y lo leía después, después lo leía como si estuviera, si tuviera el, la, le, estuviera leyendo el libro actualmente. Él venía de un colegio donde no había practicado tanto o casi nada el, el básquetbol, eh, sino más bien el soccer. Eh, y en La Habana lo que valía era el básquet. Pues él empezó enseguida a querer practicar básquet y básquet y básquet. Y enseguida me dijo a mí, oye padre, no podría ponerme usted una luz en el flor de básquet sobre el aro para que cuando los demás se acuestan yo pueda de noche seguir practicando. Cuando Fidel Castro se graduó, yo escribí que era, yo digo, Fidel Castro es madera de héroe y la historia de su patria un día tendrá que hablar de él. At the University of Havana, where Fidel arrived in 1945 to study law, the political atmosphere was so highly charged that it often turned to violence. Students fighting against corruption and injustice were targets of repression. Fidel entered the fray, not as a communist, but as a radical nationalist with a passion for social justice. La universidad fue una gran escuela, la verdad, una, una gran escuela donde para mí eh, nos formamos nosotros y se formó desde luego Fidel. Nosotros organizamos el movimiento estudiantil junto con el movimiento obrero. Fidel tenía ya desde entonces características muy especiales. La asamblea más compleja, la situación más, eh, más difícil de desentrañar, él la dominaba con la palabra. En la escuela de filosofía, el alumnado era casi todo muchachas, y además muy lindas. Tanto que en una de las casas de estudiantes que, en que estas muchachas, muchas del interior, se alojaban, le habíamos puesto la bombonera. Eh, Fidel venía a la escuela de filosofía muy a menudo porque había una carita, una muchacha, un rostro que lo había subyugado. 
He was married to a young woman who was the daughter of one of the elites. That marriage, however, only lasted uh, six years because he was imprisoned for his revolutionary activities and under considerable pressure from her family, uh, they were divorced. He did, however, have a, uh, a son uh, from that marriage. In 1952, now a practicing lawyer, Fidel ran as a candidate for the Orthodox Party, an anti-corruption coalition. Cuba's hero of independence, Jose Marti, inspired the movement. The election never took place. General Batista, who had been in power before, staged a coup to prevent an Orthodox Party victory. Por aquella época, lo que se vivía con Batista era la corrupción rampante, el juego, la prostitución, la debacle, la violencia. Estamos hablando de un país que iba al desastre. When I knew Cuba before Fidel Castro, I went there. It was the playground of the mafia. We had all the big jazz nightclubs that Nat King Cole and myself were, were, were petitioned to perform in. Uh, I, not, I did not see democracy in Cuba. Uh, as a matter of fact, if anything, I saw blatant racism and oppression. After the Batista coup, all political parties and constitutional rights were suspended. The university was shut down. But the students continued protesting. Fidel began organizing a clandestine opposition group. Muchos eran gente joven con inquietudes eh, revolucionarias que seguían a Fidel porque lo veían con condiciones de líder y porque además le decía esta etapa de Cuba hay que resolverla por la acción revolucionaria por cuanto no hay otra salida. On the 26th of July, 1953, Fidel led an attack on the Moncada garrison in Santiago de Cuba. This marked the beginning of the armed struggle against Batista. Pensábamos tratar de provocar un levantamiento nacional para el derrocamiento de Batista. Caso de no lograrse el levantamiento nacional, o en el caso de que Batista pudiera re, eh, reaccionar con fuerzas superiores y atacarnos aquí en Santiago de Cuba, la idea nuestra era con las armas del cuartel Moncada marchar a las montañas y librar la guerra irregular en las montañas. The operation had hardly begun when a group of Fidel's followers was surprised by a military patrol. Two of the 150 participants were women, Aide Santa Maria and Melba Hernandez. 61 were killed, only six in combat. The rest were tortured and murdered after their arrest. Both women survived. Fue, fue muy dura, porque después cuando resultamos prisioneros y nos llevaron para el cuartel, y los sentaron así en el piso, de allí iban sacando a los muchachos o devolviendo a los muchachos, como el caso de Gómez García, que nos, nos los devolvieron brutalmente heridos, destrozados, sin dientes, aquello era una cosa terrible. A mí no me gusta hablar de esto. Fidel survived thanks to a caring black officer. Then began what would become the most famous trial in Cuban history. Fidel, in su alegato, está terminando su alegato, da así en la mesa un, con las manos y dice: Condenadme, no importa, la historia me absolverá. Eso es lo que dice Fidel. Todo el personal se queda a la expectativa, se quedan inmóviles. Y entonces él, de pie, vuelve a hacer así: dice, Bueno, ya terminé. Al pasar por delante de mí, cuando ya se lo llevara, me dijo, ¿tomaste nota? Digo, sí. Fidel and 29 of his comrades were imprisoned on the Isle of Pines. Fidel for 15 years. He defiantly named his political movement after the date of the Moncada attack, the 26th of July, and smuggled out a manifesto based on his trial defense, entitled, History Will Absolve Me. It would become the inspiration for the revolution. Yo tuve mi, mi actitud de rebeldía, me aislaron. Tenía todo el tiempo para leer. 
Leías 12 horas, 14 horas, 16 horas. Y después nunca he tenido oportunidad de leer tantas horas seguidas. Fidel and his companions were freed after two years. Batista, giving in to popular protest, declared a general amnesty for political prisoners. Six weeks after their release, Fidel left for Mexico, and there, with a group of followers, they planned a new attempt to overthrow the dictator. Looking for support, Fidel toured Cuban communities in the United States, in New York, New Jersey, and Florida. Many sympathizers, both rich and poor, contributed to his cause. By the following year, 1956, Fidel had assembled the nucleus of a guerrilla force and felt ready to return to Cuba. A young Argentine doctor, Ernesto Che Guevara, joined them. Él los unió en primer lugar sus ideales. Hay una pequeña escrito, un pequeño escrito de mi papá donde dice, me pasé toda la noche hablando con el jefe, sí, con Fidel y al otro día amanecí siendo miembro de su de su grupo, ¿no? After the legendary 12-hour meeting, Che's life became an important part of the Cuban Revolution. 82 people, including Che, set out from Mexico on the cabin cruiser Granma. An uprising in Santiago de Cuba was planned to coincide with their arrival. Horas antes de entrar ese embarco, se cayó un hombre al agua. Empezaron a buscarlo y el hombre no aparecía y gritábamos a fulanito, Roque, Roque, y no aparecía Roque. Pero hasta que al final dice Fidel, y de aquí no nos vamos hasta que no lo, hasta que no lo salvemos. Eso conmovió a la gente y le levantó la, la, la combatividad al escuchar esa frase. Y decir, coño, con este hombre no hay, no hay abandonado. ¿Y lo encontraron? No hay olvidado. Sí, sí, lo encontramos. Lo encontramos. A costa de que se, se echara a perder la, la, la expedición. The synchronization of the uprising and landing failed the Batista military successfully put down the revolt in the city. The grandma arrived two days later than expected, and the group landed in a mangrove swamp. The 82 men scattered, but were soon discovered by Batista's forces. Fidel and a few others escaped and refused to admit defeat. Of the original 82, only 21 managed to regroup in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. This is where the guerrilla war began, and the initial group was able to survive and grow. Che Guevara was the group's doctor. The first commander that he did Fidel Castro in the Sierra, with the consensus of all of us, he said, who is the first commander? Che porque es el más preparado, porque conoce los caminos, porque para mí es el más estratega. Fue el chico. Después fue Raúl y yo, y después Camilo, Ramirito y los demás. Después. Much of their support came from the farmers in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. Some of them joined the guerrillas and became commanders. Both men and women soon joined Fidel's guerrilla movement, and despite traditional male prejudice, a women's battalion was formed. One of the most important people in his life was a woman called Celia Sanchez. She was the daughter of a rural physician. Her father had provided free health care to many of the poor, impoverished rural people in the area, and she was very much attracted to Fidel's revolutionary movement. Celia Sanchez remained at Fidel's side for 20 years and held important government posts until her death in 1980. Fidel and his commanders built up their 26th of July movement guerrilla army from a wide range of political allegiances. Batista's forces were trained by the United States, which also armed them with tanks, artillery, and aircraft. They threw all that force against the guerrillas in a war that lasted two years. The 26th of July had a strong underground movement in the cities. 
Uh, there were sabotage efforts against the Batista government and demonstrations and so forth. The Batista government reacted very strongly. Uh, bodies were left by the side of the road. Uh, students, uh, young people who were suspected of being rebel sympathizers were shot or in some cases jailed and tortured. Uh, as a result of all that, public opinion turned massively against uh, Batista. An estimated 20,000 people were murdered by government forces during the Batista dictatorship. The rebels put out leaflets and a newspaper, and by 1958 also had a radio station keeping the people informed about developments. Fidel's interviews with foreign journalists ended rumors that he had been killed. Aware of the importance of the media, he made sure he was accessible to the press, even in English. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. Muchas de las cosas que hicimos están por encima de lo que nos imaginábamos en aquella época, incluso. Y Algunas cosas de las ocurridas han sido más difíciles también y más duras de las que nos imaginábamos en aquella época. En January 1959, Fidel made a triumphal entry in Havana. It had taken 25 months to defeat Batista. With victory achieved, Fidel sought to make Cuba a united and independent nation. I'll never forget that first speech that he gave a few days after he had entered Havana. I was watching on television, but they released a flight of doves, a symbol of peace. But one of the doves uh, fluttered up into the air and landed on his shoulder. There was a gasp because uh, the pigeon uh, was the messenger of Oshun sent to uh, indicate the anointed one. The world was emotional. This is a people that in those years were very believers. El otro era más de sincretismo, ¿no? más de las cosas africanas, las palomas, el barco. Ya a partir de allí, la gente pensaba que Fidel era el, el, enviado, de, el enviado de Cristo aquí, ¿viste? Just 30 days ago, Fidel Castro entered Havana to be greeted by cheering mobs as one of the greatest heroes in Cuba's history. A week before that, General Batista and his top aides had fled the country, leaving it to Castro, his rebel army, and their supporters. Good evening, Fidel Castro. You must have had a very busy week. How do you feel? Well, I feel really, I feel well, something tired. I'm told that you saw your mother for the first time in four years this Christmas Eve. That must have been quite a reunion. What did she have to say to you? She began to cry at the beginning, and at the end, several minutes, she could not tell any word to me. Feel a little. <laughs> Hello, Fidel Jr. Hi. That's a very good-looking puppy you have there. Is he yours? No, it's somebody gave it to my father for a present. Uh-huh. When do you think you'll be visiting us again? Oh, well, I should the light. I think when I have a chance. Well, will that be uh, with the beard or without it? <laughs> well, uh, it's possible if, if I go to the United States with the beard, because I am not thinking now to, to cut my beard, because I, I am custom to my beard. And my beard means many things to my country when we have uh, fulfilled our promise of good government, I will cut my beer. 
the first people who left, I mean, in the first days after the revolution, by and large were Batista supporters and members of the Batista government. Uh, Batista fled the island New Year's Eve of 1959, and many of his supporters followed immediately uh, thereafter. Those accused of murder and torture who didn't flee the country were brought to trial. The trials, however, were criticized in the U.S. media. I was following on television the revolutionary trials that began right away, which were the beginnings of the problems with the United States. In fact, a lot of the CIA's people, or some of them at least, were uh, on trial for having been murderers and torturers of Batista. The same year he came to power, Fidel was invited to visit countries throughout Latin America. He made passionate speeches, calling for unity among the peoples of that region. He proposed the creation of a Latin American market. Also in 1959, he embarked on a tour of the United States, hoping to promote a better understanding of the Cuban Revolution. Did you ask for any economic no. assistance? Not here, you in the United States are accustomed to see government coming from for money. Not. I came for, for good relations, for good understanding, for good <laughs> economical relations. We are now poor country, but in a rich, poor people, but in a rich country. What we want is to work in our rich country. Vice President Nixon was sent to meet the new Cuban leader after President Eisenhower refused to see him. Nixon later wrote a memo describing Fidel as a communist who should be overthrown. Cuba is an obsession with American leaders, and it really doesn't matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans. It's almost a psychosis. The United States is simply incapable of dealing rationally with Castro. When Fidel got to New York, he had a warmer welcome. Rodeado por la multitud, apretujado por el entusiasmo de miles y miles de personas, entra en la estación Pensilvania de Nueva York un joven abogado, alto y barbudo, que sabe hablar un idioma sencillo y valiente, y que viste el uniforme de comandante del ejército rebelde cubano. Y esperan el mayor Wagner de Nueva York y su esposa, así como los altos dignatarios de la Babel de Hierro, para rendir homenaje al más ilustre visitante del momento, Fidel Castro. Fidel gave a reception at the Cuban embassy. Es la primera vez que se pone el traje de gala. Se miró hacia el espejo y dijo que vaya, me quito esto porque me parezco a Tito. Termina la recepción y no aparecía por ningún lado. Hasta que como a las 2 de la mañana la llegó y nosotros sentados allá abajo en la embajada esperando. Dije, ¿dónde tú estabas? Dice, no, me fui al barrio chino a comer sopa china en Nueva York solo esa noche. Esas cosas que tiene. En 1960, he traveled to the United States for a second time to address the General Assembly of the United Nations. When the manager of the Shelburne Hotel, worried about adverse publicity, asked him to leave, Fidel threatened to camp out on the grounds of the UN. El dueño negro del Hotel Teresa, del barrio negro de Harlem, ofrecía la, el hotel, inclusive gratuitamente, a Fidel y a sus compañeros de delegación. Inmediatamente Fidel dijo, vamos para el Hotel Teresa. At the Hotel Teresa, world leaders visited him, Nasser from Egypt and Nehru from India. Black activist Malcolm X also called on him, as did the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. Aquí Khrushchev le está diciendo a la prensa en contestación a una pregunta de si Fidel era comunista. Dice, yo no sé si Fidel es comunista. Yo lo que sí sé es que soy fidelista.
On his return to Cuba, the first priority of Fidel's revolution was the redistribution of land through the Agrarian Reform Act. Under Batista, foreigners had owned more than 70% of the arable land. Most of the sugar industry was in U.S. hands. At first, quite modest land expropriations were proposed. They even included land owned by Fidel's family. Fidel quería que fuera la primera. Mi padre decía, voy a, 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 a tener un hijo estudiando para abogado para que le defienda los intereses. Y bueno, fue, mire, el abogado fue el que firmó la ley de reforma agraria. Besides land redistribution, the reform included health care, education, housing, and road building in rural zones. Ya que nuestra reforma agraria afectó intereses de grandes compañías norteamericanas. A nosotros nos hacían la guerra por hacer la reforma agraria. Y en campo yo después Kennedy estaba promoviendo la reforma agraria en América Latina para evitar revoluciones radicales. Yeah, about a year after the agrarian reform was introduced and some American properties, rural properties, the King Ranch and so forth, were nationalized, the Cuban government ordered the foreign refineries, uh, two of which were American, to refine Soviet crude oil. I think their first inclination was to do it, but they were encouraged by the U.S. Treasury Department not to, so they refused. They would not refine the Soviet crude. The Cuban government then nationalized those refineries, the oil companies in Cuba. The United States retaliated for that by cutting off the Cuban sugar quota, and Cuba then retaliated for that by nationalizing all U.S. properties in Cuba, and in October of 1960, the United States imposed the embargo against Cuba. So it was sort of one step led to another. When Fidel lee the decreto most important of the Revolution Cubana, in his afan to control everything, the emotion of Fidel is so that Fidel is muddled, he loses his voice. And that was an expectation tremendous because he was in front of the national cameras and international cameras, and Fidel was muddled in front of the microphone. Y entonces Raúl, inesperadamente, toma el micrófono y continúa leyendo el decreto de, de expropiación de las eh, grandes compañías norteamericanas en Cuba. Porque se ha ido una voz por un momento, pero ahí está él y estará. Compañía cubana de electricidad. Central to understanding the Cuban Revolution is the relationship historically between Cuba and the United States. This was more than anything a nationalistic movement that Fidel was able to capitalize on, where the people in Cuba from the founding of the country had struggled for a sense of their own sovereignty and independence. In addition to land reform, Fidel placed education at the heart of the revolution. Thousands of young people set out for the most isolated parts of the island to teach the farmers to read and write.
1961 was declared the year of education. In the midst of false rumors that the revolution would take children away from their parents, the U.S. State Department and the Catholic Church organized what was later called Operation Peter Pan which airlifted 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban children to the United States. At the same time, other Cubans left for the United States and joined the exile community. The CIA began to plan the assassination of Fidel and Raul and Che, whatever leadership they could get, but especially Fidel, so as to demoralize the Cuban people and make the Bay of Pigs invasion more likely to be successful. In 1961, John Kennedy inherited the invasion plans from Eisenhower. He allowed it to go ahead, but vetoed the use of U.S. combat forces. As preliminary acts leading to the invasion, saboteurs burned thousands of acres of sugarcane, and the La Cubre, a Belgian freighter carrying arms, was blown up at a Havana dock. A second bomb was timed to explode as volunteers reached the burning ship to help the victims. Over 100 people were killed and hundreds more wounded. Moreover, exiled Cuban pilots flying American planes painted with Cuban insignia bombed two airports, killing a number of civilians. Again, Fidel called on the Cuban people. On April 16, 1961, in a dramatic speech following the funeral of those who had been killed, he made one of the most important declarations in Cuban history. Primero que empieza a preguntar, ¿están de acuerdo con la reforma urbana? Y entonces los de adelante se ven todos levantando el rifle y todo el pueblo atrás, ¿no? Y entonces sí, todo el mundo levanta. ¿Están de acuerdo con la reforma urbana? ¿Están de acuerdo con la reforma de la enseñanza? ¿Están de acuerdo, bueno, con toda la revolución que se ha hecho en la enseñanza, en la salud? Sí, sí, sí. Y entonces dice, esto que hemos hecho se llama socialismo. Y que esa revolución socialista la defendemos con esos fusiles. Fidel dirigió personalmente las operaciones y rechazaba la petición de nosotros que se pusiera a un mayor resguardo, a una mayor distancia del frente de combate. The Bay of Pigs invasion, which was launched from Nicaragua, ended in disaster. The forces directed by the United States met with intense, unexpected Cuban resistance, and the battle ended in 72 hours. The captured Cuban exiles were later exchanged for baby food and medicine. In the mountainous regions, opposition groups financed by the CIA formed pockets of resistance against the revolution, but they were eventually overcome. The overt war against the country became a covert war against the man. It was a long-running policy of the United States government, not just of the CIA, because they carry out the orders. They don't determine who's going to get assassinated. But they carry out the orders, and they had the orders from the uh, higher ups in the National Security Council and the Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Cuánto atentados habían contra usted? Plani, La CIA aparece todos los, los atentados de Fidel, con fusiles, embatidos con el cénico, en cigarro, en pelo, en no sé cuántas cosas. Siempre este está protegido en, con su traje. ¿Cuál traje? What suit? Everybody says you always have dice que a todo el mundo dice que usted tiene un, un chaleco a prueba de balas. 
Es uno de los más han intentado matar, la verdad. Pero parece que tiene siete vidas como el gato. Porque siempre está parado. And there's the fact that they haven't been able to kill him. I mean, that must really be upsetting, that they have not been able to kill this man who has persisted in being exactly who he is for all of these years against the mightiest power on the earth. It's quite phenomenal. Faced with this massive hostility from the U.S., the giant, the Colossus to the north, who is he going to turn to to protect his revolution? Sweden? India? There was only one other power on the globe that could provide any promise that that revolution perhaps could survive and last, and that was the Soviet Union. Cuba threw in its lot with the Soviet Union. One year later, Khrushchev came up with a plan to install Soviet missiles on Cuban soil. They lograron the cohetes lograban el doble propósito: fortalecer el poderío del campo socialista y también disuadir a los Estados Unidos de un ataque a Cuba porque te vendría en una guerra nuclear. Castro reluctantly agreed to accept the missiles, but then he said, at least if you're going to deliver the missiles, make it a public act. But Khrushchev thought he could do it uh, clandestinely and it would spring it on the Americans. U.S. spy planes discovered the missiles, which brought the Soviet Union and the United States to the brink of nuclear war. The crisis ended when the president's brother, Robert Kennedy, negotiated a secret deal with Khrushchev. The Soviet Union would remove the missiles if the United States withdrew its missiles from Turkey and later promised not to invade Cuba. When Khrushchev then took the missiles out without the courtesy of notifying Castro or consulting with him, Castro was furious. To mend relations between the two countries, Fidel was invited to visit the Soviet Union. His personal friendship with Khrushchev was also restored. I was here and Khrushchev was here. And I don't know what animal was coming and I shot in this direction. And it was about 10 meters away in front of Khrushchev that Khrushchev who was a farmer, you know, he was a peasant. I just remember that Khrushchev did like this. <laughs> what kind of man have I brought here? <laughs> I hardly saved my life. And you know what crossed my mind at that moment? What will happen if in one of these hunting in adventures, in, if in an accident, I kill Khrushchev? Oh, my God. <laughs> you can imagine what would have happened? <laughs> Well, he was caught in somewhat of a difficult dilemma. Pragmatically, he needed the support of the Soviet Union uh, because economically they were completely dependent. So he then constructed a relationship with the Soviet Union where he was constantly looking for ways to assert independence from the Soviets, particularly in the foreign policy arena. There were earth-shaking changes about to happen. And Fidel's ability to give expression to um, those historical changes uh, um, allowed him to, to emerge as the sort of representative of the possibility of third world countries you know, moving away from the capitalist orbit uh, toward a different kind of future. The Cuban Revolution, with Fidel and Che at its head, became an inspiration to others seeking political change in Latin America. Ahora sí, la historia tendrá que contar con los pobres de América, con los 
los explotados y vilipendiados de América Latina que han decidido empezar a escribir ellos mismos para siempre su historia. After a dramatic insurgent experience in the Congo, Che led a guerrilla group in the Bolivian jungle. On October 8, 1967, they were ambushed. Che, who was wounded in the fighting, was taken prisoner and murdered the next day. Members of the Bolivian army threw his body and those of his comrades into a secret grave. Si queremos un modelo de hombre, un modelo de hombre que no pertenece a este tiempo, un modelo de hombre que pertenece a los tiempos futuros, de corazón digo que ese modelo es el Che. Fidel continued to support struggles all over the world. Queremos brindarle al pueblo de Vietnam nuestra más decidida solidaridad y apoyo. In Vietnam, where Ho Chi Minh led a popular liberation movement, Cuba sent sugar, rice, and blood donations, and trained doctors, engineers, teachers, and agricultural workers. Fidel se lamentaba no haber conocido a Ho Chi Minh. En un gesto así de de impotencia, Fidel hace así y da unos pasos para adelante, para atrás, y hace así y dice, porque lo que no me perdonaré nunca, haberme demorado el poquito de tiempo que me demoré en llegar a Vietnam, que no me permitió conocer a Ho Chi Minh. Eso no me lo perdonaré nunca, Melba, no haber conocido a ese hombre tan gigante que tú sí conociste. In 1970, Allende's Chilean revolution offered another model of change, the peaceful road to socialism. Fidel made a supportive tour of the country. En Chile está ocurriendo un proceso único, insólito. Es un proceso revolucionario donde los revolucionarios tratan de llevar adelante los cambios pacíficamente. Al pueblo chileno que siempre estuvo y estará junto al pueblo de Cuba y a su proceso revolucionario. For the United States, the Chilean road to socialism was no more acceptable than the Cuban one. In 1973, the CIA backed a coup by General Pinochet, which led to President Allende's violent death. Cuba backed the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, who were victorious in 1979. The assassination of his friend Maurice Bishop in Grenada was a great blow to Fidel. Internal divisions in Grenada opened the way for the United States to invade. Cuban construction workers were caught in the middle and some were killed and wounded. With the change of the political climate in Latin America, Fidel visits Ecuador. There have been many changes in the last 25-30 years in the hemisphere. Yo diría sí que tenemos más conciencia que nunca de nuestra identidad y de nuestra independencia. 30 years after Che Guevara was murdered in Bolivia, his remains and some of those who fought with him were finally found and returned to Cuba. Their families were at the airport. Che's daughter, 
who was five years old when he left, and the man with whom he is always identified, paid tribute to him and his guerrilla comrades. Hace más de 30 años, nuestros padres se despidieron de nosotros. Partieron para continuar los ideales de Bolívar, de Martí, un continente unido e independiente. No volvimos a verlos. En esa época, la mayoría de nosotros éramos muy pequeños. Ahora somos hombres y mujeres, vivimos, quizás por primera vez, momentos de mucho dolor, de intensa pena. Hoy llegan a nosotros sus restos, pero no llegan vencidos. Vienen convertidos en héroes, eternamente jóvenes, valientes, fuertes, audaces. Nadie puede quitarnos eso. Siempre estarán vivos junto a sus hijos, en su pueblo. Hasta la victoria siempre, patria o muerte. Muchas veces he soñado, yo a veces le he contado a la gente las cosas que uno sueña. Y he soñado que estoy, he hablado, que estoy hablando con él, que está vivo. Una cosa muy especial, una persona que no le cuesta mucho trabajo resignarse a la idea de su muerte. Y a qué obedece eso, a mi juicio, que que tiene una presencia siempre tan permanente. En, en todo. If I was writing history, um, I would write about um, the way in which Fidel, as the leader of one of the smallest countries uh, in the world, uh, helped to shape uh, uh, the destinies of millions of people across the globe. Yo creo que él ha llenado un capítulo muy intenso en la historia de Cuba y en la historia de América Latina. Durante este tiempo, él condujo a Cuba a ser como la conciencia crítica en este continente. It's not just Castro the man. It's, it's, it, 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 he carries with him a meaning, a signification, which is of tremendous importance to people like ourselves who are the marginalized of the world. And Africa, as a mother country, to so many Cubans, needed to be addressed as part and parcel of the worldwide thing of African liberation. Right from the beginning, Cuba's revolutionary ideals not only spread throughout Latin America, but also forged strong ties with national liberation leaders, such as Secu Touré, Amilcar Cabral, Julius Nyerere, Samora Machel, and Agostino Neto. When the invasion of Angola by troops regular of Africa, we could not cross our arms. And when the MPLA solicited our help, we offered the necessary help. In 1975, as Angola moved towards independence from Portugal, the CIA, along with the apartheid government of South Africa, tried to bring down the new Angolan government. At the request of the Angolan president, Fidel sent 36,000 troops to keep the South African forces from attacking Luanda, the capital. 
For many Cubans, whose ancestors were African slaves, the fight in Angola was a way to repair a debt to history. In 14 years of war, over 300,000 Cubans, doctors, teachers, and engineers, as well as soldiers, played an important role in Angola. More than 2,000 lost their lives. In 1988, Fidel sent in more Cuban troops for the decisive battle at Quito Cuanavale and directed operations from Cuba. The defeat of the South African army drove a large nail into the coffin of apartheid and helped advance the struggle of the South African people. Una derrota en aquellas condiciones hubiera podido significar el fin de la revolución cubana. Y todo eso ocurrió después del 75. Pero hay que reunir todo el material y eso. Pero nosotros no hemos escrito ni siquiera la historia de la Revolución Cubana. Had it not been for the Cuban presence in Africa, and in particular in Angola, the history of Africa would have never been what it is now. One of the greatest friends that Cuba has is Nelson Mandela and his appreciation for what the Cuban people did and Fidel Castro. But I think if you don't understand that history, then you'll never really understand the enormous success and the importance of the Cuban Revolution. Well, my president, my president, my brother, my brother, how are you? My brother, please, please, very nice to see you. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Now, one thing before we say anything. Una cosa antes de hablar, nada, nada. Before we say anything. Antes de hablar absolutamente de cualquier tema. You must tell me when you are coming to South Africa. Me tiene que decir cuándo viene para Sudáfrica. Lo yo sé, no, 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 un momento. Es seguro, si ya yo recibí. The sooner the better. And we have had a visit from a wide variety of people. Y hemos visitado una gran cantidad de personas. And our friend Cuba. Y nuestro amigo Cuba. Which helped us in training our people. Que nos ayudó a entrenar a nuestra gente. Gave us resources to get on with our struggle. Que nos ayudaron tanto nuestra lucha. Trained our people as doctors and so on. Que entrenó a nuestros pacientes, a nuestros médicos. You have not come to our country. Cuba no ha venido a visitarnos. Usted no ha ido a visitar. When are you coming? ¿Cuándo viene? <laughs> no he visitado a mi patria surafricana. I haven't visited my South African homeland yet. La quiero como una patria. I want it. I love it as a homeland. Y por el pueblo. I love it as a homeland as I love you and the South African people. When are you coming to South Africa? Pero cuándo viene South Africa? Creo que va a tener que ser hoy mismo o va a tener que ser I think we'll have to be today. I will have to fly back with you. No, you are very, very, very sure. Lleva las 10. You are leaving at 10, so we are catching the plane together. Soon afterwards, Fidel did go to South Africa and on his way stop off in Namibia, where he was greeted by Sam Najoma, the nation's leader. Welcome to the Republic of Namibia. Bienvenido a la República de Namibia. The country which you helped to reparate, to be reparated. In South Africa, Mandela was waiting. Fidel was invited to address the South African parliament. Convierta South Africa in a model de un mundo futuro más justo y más humano. Let South Africa be a model of a more just and more humane future. Si ustedes pueden, todos podemos. If you can do it, we will all be able to do it. The 
Waddell is linked to the uh, post-colonial era as the figure who more than any, I think, symbolizes independence and sovereignty of small nations, shaking off the yoke of the imperial powers, uh, and the fact that he has been there for as long as he has and has been able to magnify his role to really a global, a global force from this tiny island base. It is easy to build a nation. It is far more difficult to shape a society. And this is what Cuba is doing. It will need all the time in the world. It will need all the humility, all the meekness, all the generosity of spirit to itself and to others to emerge. In the 70s and 80s, Cuba's battleground on the home front was the economy. Tremendous efforts were made to industrialize the country and create shared wealth in spite of the continuing U.S. blockade. Cuba was dependent on a single crop, sugar. The Soviet Union promised to buy as much as could be produced. Fidel tried to spur the country on through personal example in the attempt to reach new harvest levels. <laughs> Es una tarea titánica, realmente. Y salir del subdesarrollo en las condiciones de Cuba todavía más bloqueada por Estados Unidos. The paradox of Cuba's independence, depending on support from the Soviet Union, involved Fidel in a balancing act that lasted 30 years. Help from the Soviet Union made it possible for Cuba to maintain its advances in universal education and health care and to promote sports and scientific development, as well as greater industrial diversification. The government of Fidel Castro has shown a world that is teeming with billions of impoverished people that it is possible for a very poor country, emerging from sickness and ignorance and corruption and poverty of a Batista regime, to within a few short years, educate all of its children, to create a system of education that is comprehensive, that reaches the entire society, that abolishes illiteracy, that is capable of export to other countries to help them learn to read and write and grow and know. By the mid-1980s, Fidel began to perceive problems in the economy and industry. Supplies of goods became sporadic, and there was growing corruption. The Cuban dream of an egalitarian society was in danger. Fidel's response to the crisis was to personally oversee every aspect of Cuban society. He criticized, cajoled, and reorganized in his own unique style. 